Let's talk Detroit's top prospects all today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Tuesday, August 13th, 2024. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team Every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as playoffs wind down and the sports stop sporting like we want them to. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Welcome in. Welcome all. Happy Tuesday, everybody. So uh, today we have no baseball game to talk about. The Tigers had an off day. On Monday, they start a series against the Mariners again, starting tonight, uh, three games set, this time at home, so not late nights, thank goodness, a little bit earlier uh, in in the evening, we play Seattle this time around, um, so we'll preview that a little bit at the end of the show, but we haven't done a kind of prospects conversation and just talked about where a lot of these big name prospects are currently within their standing of the organization in a while. Uh, we we have not had the time, to be honest, between uh, All Star break and then trade deadline and all of the you know the first half of the season when the Tigers were actually in it, right? Like th- there wasn't uh, too much of an opportunity to have this conversation, I think now is actually a perfect time. So I think it worked out really well because post-deadline is when a lot of promotions and demotions and just organization roster moves in general happen. Uh, So I think that this is kind of the perfect opportunity. Obviously, post-trade deadline, we're also throwing in new prospects that we acquired via trade too. So I, I think it really kind of worked out well that we were too busy to have this conversation until today because I, I think that this is kind of the, the best case to talk about it. Obviously, we'll have plenty of other conversations, plenty more conversations surrounding the uh, the prospects in this organization going forward. And then once we get into the offseason, we'll do you know deep dives on a lot of players. We don't have you know, time to do 30 minutes on all of these guys today, clearly, right? Because we're trying to keep this episode around 30 minutes, but I never do a very good job at that. So let's just start off with the top, I guess, of the heap, kind of the the cream of the crop at the very top of the Tigers farm system is Max Clark and Jackson Job. Uh, Most have Clark at one, Job at two, but plenty of lists have Job at one, and Clark at two, uh, Joe believed to be one of the best pitching prospects in the entire sport, which is really awesome because the Tigers already have possibly the best pitcher on the planet uh, leading their rotation. So the thought of adding Jackson Job to that mix is really exciting. Um, I want to see Jackson Job in AAA. <laughs> it's really kind of like where I'm at at this point. Uh, you know, he's had a, a really solid season. In double A, and I think that's honestly putting it lightly. He has a 227 ERA in 11 starts, just under 50 innings. The swing and miss stuff is there. Uh, he's been, I guess, walking a little bit more than maybe he did last year when he was walking like literally nobody, um, but still has a really good feel for the zone. It gets a little sporadic, I guess, sometimes, but I think that just comes with the development path that he is currently on. Uh, a lot of guys that have you know, like generational stuff at some point in their development have some trouble locating it at times because it's just almost like too good, as weird as that sounds. I think that's something that he deals with a little bit. He also, honestly, uh, a big thing from the starts that I've, the the last four or five starts, I try to watch every single Jackson Job start. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, But uh, I I think something I've noticed in the last four or five outings is that the mechanics I want to see just more repeatable. Um, not that they're, you know, he looks like a completely different pitcher every time he goes out there. But uh, I think that that's just something that, again, will come. He's 22 years old. Like that'll come with with repetition and time. Uh, he's had injury stuff uh, most seasons so far in his professional career. So I think just getting a full season of work under his belt, letting him go deeper into ball games, all of that is important. 
And yeah, I'm honestly surprised he's not in AAA uh, currently post deadline. I thought that was kind of a, a pristine and, and perfect opportunity to move him up the organizational ladder. And we haven't yet. So I would still like to see that. But no matter what happens the rest of this season, I can pretty much promise you he will be in the big league camp for spring training next year. And he will start off the season in AAA next year. So really like what we've seen out of him. And then Max Clark has made a lot of adjustments this season. He got promoted to West Michigan a few weeks ago and is hitting pretty darn well there. Uh, hitting about 295 has an OPS of 794. So far, that's in 15 games. Down in Lakeland, before that, he was hitting 286 with an 807 OPS. So pretty similar numbers. Um, he got off to a really slow start again this year and then consistently made adjustments. And that's something that has been very prevalent in Max Clark's development since getting drafted was like this dude has made a ton of swing adjustments and for the amount of like I, I think unjustified crap that gets thrown his way just for like being a big personality and being in the public eye and and, and whatnot um this is a guy that has clearly been extremely coachable already in his career and, and like just wants to be great and has listened to coaches has made countless like I, I cannot stress enough the amount of bat path and, and and mechanical and leg kick and lesser leg kick and like he has made so many adjustments so far and I think he deserves a lot of credit for that because there's this like general I don't know uh like opinion about him that just because he's a big personality is like almost a negative connotation and I have seen nothing like literally not a single thing so far since becoming a member of the Tigers organization that has led me to, uh, I don't know, like lean into or believe that the, the negative side of, you know, the, the public perception of him. So um, I liked what I've seen so far. He's been fantastic in West Michigan. Didn't even really get off to a slow start and then get hot like he did in Lakeland this year. Just kind of out the gates, crushing the ball, um, really uh, making his presence known on the, ba on the base paths as well. Good defensively. Uh, I uh, West Michigan is a fun team to watch right now. Um, I watch a lot of <laughs> West Michigan Whitecaps games because they are filled with a lot of the organization's top prospects, like a lot. Um, their lineup is, is really a, a really fun look into the future. So those are the two uh, we spent. I, I can't afford to spend that much time on everybody or else we'd only get through about six or, or, or eight guys here. But uh, those two are, are just so clearly the top two prospects in the organization that I think they're worth talking about quite a bit. Uh, Kevin McGonigal, usually in most lists, top five, uh, depending on who you look at, maybe even top three. I love Kevin McGonigal. I, I absolutely love this dude. This season in Lakeland, he had an 877 OPS and a 326 average. In West Michigan, he got off to a slower start, but has been picking up a little bit more lately. Um, again, only 14 games, got promoted with Max Clark, hitting only 214, but again, really small sample size so far there. Um, his swing is just beautiful. I don't think he sticks at shortstop. I don't think he needs to stick at shortstop to be a productive Major League Baseball player. I Love Kevin McGonigal. I think he is absolutely a part of the future of this team. I think he's arguably the best pure hitting prospect this organization has right now. I would say there's a better chance that he is an a he is a, a, a I don't know great to elite hitter than Jace Young or or than even Max Clark being thrown in there. Right, Clark affects the game in a lot of different ways. He'll be a really good hitter, um, but he can also, again, steal a lot of bases, be a good defender, etc. McGonagall doesn't have that. He's not going to steal a lot of bases. He's not probably not going to be a great defender. The kid can rake. He has some of the most beautiful and flawless mechanics I have seen from a Tigers prospect in a while. Um, and I think there's an adjustment to be made here. Clearly, again, he's hitting 214 and 14 games in West Michigan, but. Um, I, I can't say enough good things about him. I think he's a part of the future of this team as well. Okay. Let's, uh, let's keep it rolling. We got a lot more prospects to talk about. A lot of the prospects they got at the deadline we're going to talk about today. And then we're also going to talk about players whose stock has maybe fallen throughout this year, right? We don't have time to, uh, again, like break down everybody and talk about all of their like exact fine detail strength and weaknesses and whatnot, but we can talk about the players who going into the season 
have had seen their stock maybe drop and have seen them fall on lists across the media world going into the year. And then obviously we'll keep talking about the players who've had really good seasons as well. Okay, we'll do all of that right after this. Got to talk to you today about our friends over at Ibotta. It's summertime, which means it's barbecue season. You can stock up on all your grilling favorites and earn cash back on every purchase when you use Ibotta. So you won't have to choose between burgers and hot dogs. You can just get both. Ibotta is a free app that lets you earn cash back every time you shop. Earn on hundreds of items from groceries, beauty supplies, even toys, so you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're chasing. The average I bought a user earns $256 per year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip, that flight you've been eyeing, or the fancy dinner that you've been craving. Other apps give you points that don't really amount to much, and with I bought a, you earn real cash back that can get withdrawn straight to your bank account, PayPal, or even gift cards. You can simply add offers in the app, upload your receipt, and voila, the money is yours. It's time you joined over 50 million users who use Ibotta and earn cash back every time they shop. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta and using the code LOCKEDONMLB when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app to start earning cash back and use code LOCKEDONMLB. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store using code LOCKEDONMLB. Also got to talk to you all about our friends over at FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much, and I never want them to stop. But the playoffs have ended earlier in the summer. Olympics are now done. We get fewer and fewer games in in August, right, especially early and mid-August. And the sports just aren't sporting like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus Daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So head over to fanduel.com and start making the most out of your summer. Fanduel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked On Tigers. Appreciate y'all for tuning in, making us your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We will, of course, be back tomorrow recapping game one against the Seattle Mariners. And uh, talking about anything else that happens surrounding the Tigers organization. And after you make us your first listen, be sure to make Lockdown MLB your second listen. Host Paul Sullivan, a.k.a. Sully, is here to provide daily national expertise with his trademark humor to get you ready for the MLB playoffs here in the dog days of summer. Again, Lockdown MLB, available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. So we talked about the, what I view kind of as like the three highest ceiling prospects in this organization in Clark, Job and McGonigal. Um, Jace Young finds himself in a lot of conversations when you talk about top prospects in the organization, I think rightfully so. Uh, hitting 263 with an 848 OPS in Toledo this season. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, Jace Young needs to get called up, needs to get called up, needs to get called up. I understand it. And I think that, again, if you're going to call him up like at the beginning of next season, then it makes more sense to call him up now to get him adjusted and help him adjust, kind of like the conversation we had with Colt Keith last year. But there are still a lot of holes in Jace Young's game. This is not just like, oh my goodness, he's hitting, you know, he's putting up Barry Bonds numbers and playing elite defense. Like how there's no justification for keeping him down. His defense has been brutal. The offense, uh, I would say, has gone through peaks and valleys, I think is probably the way I want to put it. He's gotten on some really hot streaks. He's hit well for a majority of the year. Not trying to take away from him, but there have been some really low lows and he still strikes out a lot. He has a huge swing and miss problem and that's at triple A. When, when, you, when you promote someone from AAA to the majors, the gap, as we've said a lot over the last calendar year, the gap between AAA pitching and Major League pitching, I think, is the widest it has ever been in the history of this sport. So there's still a lot that needs to work on. He's got some funky mechanics, too, so that's always going to be something that people point to and go, like, adjustments, adjustments, adjustments kind of thing, which I, I, I kind of understand. I still think there's a really good baseball player in Jason. I'm not trying to, like, turn people away from young and, and not be excited about him. I, I still think that 
he's playing Major League Baseball for the Tigers next year in some capacity, whether that's, you know, post deadline or or a September call up next year, which I know is still like a year from now. It's a long way away or whether it's early in the season. I don't know. We'll see how the rest of the year plays out. Um, but this is not like some guy that's just absolutely dominating in Toledo and it makes no sense why he's not up here. There's still a lot that uh, of room to grow in Jace Young's game, and he's still only 23 years old. He, we, we have time with that, right? Um, th- there's nothing wrong with him staying down there. Now, again, if you're going to call him up early next year, I want him to be in the majors this year. I, I I will regurgitate that conversation we had with Colt Keith last season and, and with Malloy, I guess, too. That there is no point to me to keep him down if you're gonna just call him up very, you know, in the first couple of months of next season. Get him adjusted to major league pitching if that's the plan. But if that's not the plan, then I kind of understand seeing him try to work through some of these things he's seen. Um, okay, so number four. Five on MLB Pipeline, usually around the same, depending on what list you look at. Uh, Lorenzo. Fedron Lorenzo obviously was the headliner in the trade for Jack Flaherty from the Dodgers. This dude has been absolutely electric since coming over from LA. He's hitting 267 with a 405 on base percentage and an 872 OPS. Now it's just nine games, so a very small sample size. But he's still switch hitting. He's still catching. Um, the defense has a lot of room to improve. Uh, I'll, I'll be blunt about it. Um, the, the catching defense has b- been not great. Um, but I still think you should keep him there. I, it clearly isn't affecting the hitting so far. And I think that at his peak value, he is a catcher. So tr- you obviously want to get peak value out of all of your prospects. He's only 21 years old. I think it makes no sense to just bail and give up on the catching this early on. So I I agree with continuing to throw him out there and see if he can adjust to it. Um, But the biggest thing about him is he's been crushing from both sides of the plate. Um, He's hit a homer from the right side. That's what we were told was the weaker side uh, between his switch hittingness. And I, I think I've really liked what I've seen. The mechanics I think are good. I think it's a beautiful swing. He hits the ball really, really hard. And I'm excited. I'm excited about him. I, I think that this is a guy that could be an Erie in double A next season. And, and that would be, uh, I, I think, a success given the uh, what, what you gave up for him and given the other players that were a part of that trade as well. We'll talk about Sweeney a little bit later. Ty Men's had a really rough year, to be honest. And that's something that, uh, it's it, I don't know, it's unfortunate. The, the dude has an ERA in Toledo of 8-5. Now, his most recent start, that's not in like no starts either. That's in 16 outings. It's not like it's, oh, it's only three outings, whatever. Like, it's not a small sample size. He's been in AAA pretty much all year. He's had an 8-5 ERA. There's a lot of questions about his fastball. It has been getting crushed this year. Now, his again, his most recent start, he kind of looks really good again. And that's the first time I've seen him look that good all season um, but that is, it has not been a very good year for Ty Madden. I would kind of expect his stock to drop going into the winter. Another guy who's, I think, stock is dropping is Wilmer Flores. In the spring, Wilmer Flores came into to training camp throwing borderline 100 miles an hour. And we were like, oh my goodness, we found a, a really good reliever out of him. We're, we're throwing away starting pitcher, and we're just going to make him a reliever, and he's going to be great. He has an ERA over six and has dealt with a lot of injury stuff this season. I think his stock is probably falling. This is back-to-back years where he has not had great seasons. Um, last year wasn't as poor as this year, and he was still a starter last year. Um, but an ERA around four in Double A, given in 2022 he was like the hottest prospect in the organization that flew up rankings and everybody was pumped about. So it's unfortunate to see him take this step back, but we'll see what he can work on. You know, get fully healthy really is his biggest priority. This winter, um, Justice Bigby, another guy whose stock has fallen a little bit, um, just does, doesn't have any power, and his average has dropped. This is a guy that hit 360 in double A last season. A friend of the program as well had him on the show last year. Great dude, and is uh, clearly wants to get better and is, is constantly trying to learn and whatnot. Really fun conversation. Um, this year, at a full season in triple A, sitting under 250 and there's been a lot of question marks about whether he can handle velocity um he hit the ball the other way a ton 
last season with his 362 average. And I think that that's caught up with him a little bit. So we'll see if he can make adjustments and get back out there. Um, but yeah, has seen himself fall out of the top 10 in prospect lists a lot of places. Let's talk how you Lee, one of my favorite prospects in the Tigers organization. We'll do that right after this. Got to talk to you all today about our friends over at SupplyHouse.com. Get supplies from the site that's made for the skilled trades, SupplyHouse.com. SupplyHouse.com is the reliable way to order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical products online. Their easy-to-use website is packed with helpful resources and the latest product info to help you get the job done right. You can shop a complete inventory of over 200,000 parts from over 400 top brands and get your order delivered right to your door for, with fast shipping from coast to coast. If you need help with an order, get expert support and industry-leading service from the friendliest folks in the business and talk to a real person every time. Pros in the skilled trades can get a competitive edge by joining SupplyHouse.com's free Trade Master program. Every Trade Master gets access to a dedicated phone line, free shipping, and discounts on every order. Join the thousands of trade pros already benefiting from their free membership program at SupplyHouse.com slash TM and order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical supplies from anywhere with just a few clicks at SupplyHouse.com. All right, everybody, welcome back. Your third and final segment, Locked on Tigers. Appreciate y'all for tuning in as always. So getting into uh, on Pipeline, we're in like about halfway through, so we'll see how much we can get through here at the end of the show. We're not going to go through all 30. We've I've skipped a lot of the players that um, have either had like kind of middle-of-the-road seasons or are just like in the majors or hurt or whatnot, like Sawyer Gibson Long still in the top 10. Cater Montero, we talk about plenty. He's listed at seven on MLB Pipeline, right? Like, we didn't really have full conversations about them. We talk about those guys all the time. Um, How You Lee has had a fantastic season in AA Erie, and I am very kind of perplexed on why he's not in AAA. Um, I, I think it makes all the sense in the world to promote him now. He'll start off next season in AAA. I can almost promise you. I don't understand why we're not getting ahead of that. Um, some I'll, Again, post-deadline. A lot of the the, the roster moves kind of happened. A lot of the promotions and demotions, the shakeup kind of happened then. I don't understand what else he has to prove in double-A. I think he's ready for triple-A. I think I want to see him in triple-A. He's hitting about 300 with an 850 OPS, found a power stroke this season that has helped him a lot, is still walking a really solid amount. I I, I don't know. I It's one of the head scratchers. He was in the Futures game. Him and Max Clark were the only two Tigers representatives in the Futures game on All-Star Weekend. He has had an unbelievable season. That trade is looking like more and more of a win every day. Uh, Lorenzen for how you lease straight up. I, I don't know why he's still in double-A. Paul Wilson at 15, one of my favorite pitching prospects in the organization. They took him last year. He's had a slow start. He's in rookie ball. Uh, he is, is he still 18 even? He's 19 now. Uh, this is a guy who's still very, very far away. We're talking about like four or five years. He was drafted out of high school last year. Big, tall lefty. Throws a really, really solid fastball. Just working on developing the rest of it, but has plenty of time. Um, I, I think another player that I have really liked when he's been healthy and that got a lot of attention in spring training is Josu Brezeno. This is a catcher that's also played some first base. Uh, I believe this is the guy that A.J. Hinch said he had, quote, a man crush on in spring training. He hits the heck out of the baseball. And this year, when he's been healthy in Lakeland, hitting over 300 with an 831 OPS, um, he just hasn't been healthy very much. He's only played in 28 games this season. Has had a leg injury, PCL or MCL maybe. Um, PCL, that's a sports league. Um, that's a minor league system league. Uh, I, I think it was an MCL injury, but don't quote me on that. I'm notoriously not a doctor. Um, but brasenio has been a really, really fun player to watch these last couple of seasons. He was a part of the international signing class two years ago now. And has really just flown up rankings. Uh, there's a, a flown, flown. That's a word, right? By the winter, it wouldn't shock me if this dude was a top 15 prospect in the Tigers organization on most lists. And he already is in some. Um, I, I really like what I've seen out of him. He's done nothing but rake. And he's another guy that he hits lefty, throws righty. And that they're going to see if he can stick at catcher. Because that's where, again, his value would be at his best. But if he doesn't, then they'll move him to first base. And, uh, and, and that'll be fine, but only 19 years old for him as well. And those stats that I read you again, were from Lakeland. So in single a, when he 
is uh, when he is healthy. Jaden Ham, somebody that I blame myself for not talking nearly enough about, has been maybe the biggest riser in the entire organization this year. And I genuinely mean that. This is a right-handed pitcher currently in West Michigan for the Detroit Tigers. And in some rankings, there are some people that think he's like a borderline, you know, like top 100 prospect. Like as, And I think that's a little, you know, forward. But like he has had a phenomenal season in West Michigan, has a 275 ERA in 20 starts, has over 100 strikeouts, an opponent average of 212, uh, a whip of 110. You name it, he has been good at it, really been filling the strike zone a lot too, not walking too many guys. 21 years old, he was drafted in the fifth round in 2023 and has, yeah, just looked really, really solid. He's got wild mechanics. He almost like looks up in the air and really kind of tilts all the way back. It's a lot of momentum and then kind of throws it way over the top. It almost kind of reminds me, it has some cricket influence in it, if you will, right? Like that's kind of what it, uh, what it looks like a little bit, but man, does he fill the strike zone? He has pretty darn solid command at this point in his career and the fastball and curveball are two really good pitches for him. Now there's still a lot of work to be done. I'm not trying to say that this is like a finished product. There's a lot of work on the slider. I want to see there's a lot of work that's needed on the change up. Um, his fastball also velocity wise is only like a 93 ish mile an hour pitch, maybe give or take uh, a mile an hour there on either side. But uh, the biggest thing with him for those who are really big nerds and like inverted uh, inverted, Induced vertical break, rather, IVB. He is an IVB darling, uh, if you will. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that he goes over the top. Um, but this is a, a guy that has a lot of break on his fastball. And Tigers Minor League Report does a fantastic job kind of covering Ham in general. Well, all of our prospects, they're, I think, the best source for um, Tigers prospect, you know, info and whatnot, certainly more than uh, than me. But I, I think that Ham is a guy that they have done a really good job covering and talking about his strengths and weaknesses as well. So Ham's a fun guy to watch. I love watching his starts. He's a guy that I've been able to catch quite a lot of as well. Enrique Jimenez, uh, another catcher. He was part of the Tigers International Prospect Group last year, part of that squad. So he's only 18 years old. And, you know, so far this year, I think he's been fine. He's still very much in the rookie league. And last year he hit well, but that was in, I mean, that was in like the complex, right? Like that's the DSL Tigers um, that he's playing with. Hit well with them uh, again in the rookie league. I mean, he's in again now the FCL, um, but is is hitting pretty fine, uh, like not tearing the cover off the ball, but certainly not struggling either. I think he probably stays there, should stay there. This is a guy that is a switch hitting catcher and that a lot of people are really excited about. And I think he's kind of backed that up so far this season. Uh, Montalvo, uh, obviously a guy that the Tigers got at the trade deadline this year from Texas. Um, yeah, I mean, he's only made one outing for the Tigers, but it was three innings of shutout ball. So good for him. We talked about him a lot more. We're not going to spend too much time on him because we kind of broke him down during the trade deadline. Eddie's Leonard might be a guy whose stock has fallen a little bit. Now, some of that, not his fault. Uh, he's dealt with a lot of injury issues, unfortunately, this season, but he's not hitting too well when he's been on the field either. 243 average, 683 OPS. Um, like he, he still hits the ball very hard. And that's obviously the the thing that kind of put him on the map, if you will, this spring training and at the end of last year, post trade deadline, when we acquired him from the Dodgers as well. But there's still a lot of swing and miss in his game. And I, I, I really, I just want him to get to the finish line this year and then get healthy and we'll kind of reevaluate next year. I'm not even really taking too much stock and I still like the player. I still like the profile. Um, the thing that's going to be interesting to watch with him is I don't think he has options left. So after this season, we're going to have to see if he's bound for the major league roster or not. It's one of the reasons why the Dodgers uh, had no issue getting rid of him last season. I also think he's not going to stick at shortstop, so it's a matter of where he falls in defensively as well. There's a lot of question marks surrounding Leonard's game, um, but uh, there's still a profile in there that the Tigers are are pretty excited about. Um, Lyle Lockhart, we did a breakdown of a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I, I really like this player. I think, you know, not going to blow you away with velocity, but he's had a pretty darn good season. 
in Toledo. And I think that uh, the ERA is really high. I know that kind of freaks some people out, um, but it had a sub two ERA in Erie before getting called up in triple a ERAs are, are wild. Now uh, Ty Madden's is eight and a half. That's a little high. Um, but uh, I, I think that triple a ERA is something that is kind of a, I don't know, like almost a myth. Like we've seen so many players over the years have crazy bad ERAs and triple a get called up and been really good. Reese Olsen uh, being kind of the, the biggest name there, but uh, I mean, Miguel Diaz last year was one of our better relievers down the stretch. He had an awful ERA, like et cetera, et cetera. There, there's a lot that goes into that. It's kind of a launching pad. There's a lot of really good hitters and a lot of home runs are hit in AAA. So I would still like to see him get an opportunity. Trey Sweeney has got off to a great start since becoming a Toledo mud hen hitting 400 with an 1100 OPS so far in Toledo. Now it's only nine games and his, uh, his, we talked about him. We don't have to spend too much time on this either. Cause we broke him down when the trade deadline happened. He was obviously part of that Flaherty deal as well. Um, he's had pretty consistent stats at every level of his professional career. So I don't expect this crazy hot streak to really last. And uh, he's not going to hit 400, obviously. Um, and he's not Barry Bonds. So he's not going to have an 1100 OPS. But uh, I do think that it's been nice to see him get off to a good start. I think that kind of calms some people down about the trade deadline. I think Sweeney should get an opportunity at the major league level, to be honest with you. And, and that's not me saying that I'm like the most confident in him. I think he still has a lot of holes in his game. And there's a lot of mechanical stuff with him that I think needs to get worked out. Uh, a lot of bat path stuff that I don't really like particularly. We can talk about that more in depth maybe in the off season. But um, I, with him, it, it's just like, I would rather Trey Sweeney get reps at the major league level than, I mean, pick your, like Ryan Kreidler or then uh, Zach McKinstry or th like there, there's so many. Then Ryan Valade, then uh, like even Bly Madris, he got off to a nice start, but like has come down to earth. Like I, I, I just, I would rather see a guy that at least has a chance to be a part of the future than, than guys who, who probably don't. So that's kind of where I stand with Sweeney. Dylan Smith, man, breaks my heart. Uh, I was a really big fan of Dylan Smith out of Alabama. I think that he is a guy that has just seen his draft stock plummet or his stock within the organization plummet since being drafted. Um, just has been hurt so much when he's been on the field, hasn't been great. Um, yeah, finds himself really falling out of top 30 lists in the Tigers organization, which for a guy that was like borderline top 10, you know, the year after his draft year is really sad to see. So hopefully he can get healthy, man. Like I, 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 he's still 24 years old. Like he was a guy that was in double a last year and now is in high single a, like he literally got demoted from one year to the next, which doesn't happen very often. It's been really unfortunate. Two guys whose stock has probably fallen the most in the entire Tigers organization is Roberto Campos and Christian Santana. Two guys that at the time were, uh, two of the highest paid international free agents that the Tigers had quite literally ever signed. Uh, Roberto Campos was almost a meme within the Tigers organization and fan base at one point because they signed him when he was like 15 years old in 2019 and uh, or 16 years old, however old he would have been. And we just didn't see him for like three years, but everybody was like highest paid international prospect ever in the history of the Tigers organization at the time. Just wait, he's going to be crazy, like power-speed combination. He's going to be great. And then he struggled mightily when he got, you know, started playing professional ball, turned 18, and got put in the rookie league and low A and everything. And now this year, we're seeing it get put together a little bit more. Now, he he's, again, fallen a lot because of the, the rank. I mean, he was like the fifth-ranked prospect in the organization when he was 17 years old. Like, he, he's fallen a lot stock-wise since then. But this year especially lately. We're seeing the power a little bit more. We're seeing the speed a little bit more. We're seeing, you know, what the, the tools in practice, he's hitting a lot more consistently. Um, so in West Michigan so far, he's played a full season there up to this point, 257 average, 738 OPS. I, I, I've i liked what I've seen. It's not a perfect product. I think he should stay down in West Michigan, but if he's in Erie next season, I think that that kind of gets, he's still only 21. Like he's still so young because of how long we've been hearing about him, right? It feels like he's 30. I mean, he's still only 21, um, but 6'3", 200 pounds, there's pop in there and there's some speed in there. I think that this year kind of put him back on the map a little bit. Again, fallen in general over the last couple of years, but I don't hate what I've seen from Roberto Campos. Christian Santana, a different conversation. 
Um, Christian Santana stock has just plummeted because he can't hit. <laughs> like it's really that simple. This dude hit 156 in a full season in Lakeland last season and is hitting 151 in Lakeland this season. He he can't hit. Uh, he, he has a lot of strikeouts. He walks a ton. And when he does get a hold of the baseball, he can hit it pretty hard. It doesn't matter when you're batting 150 in single A, man. Uh, there's some questions about where he falls in defensively as well. There was a point in time, and this kind of just shows you how much I know. Um, th there was a point in time when Christian Santana was one of my favorite prospects in the organization because he was athletic and drew a ton of walks and had some pop for a small frame. I really liked him a lot. Th there's just no way you can justify that conversation now um they're not going to give up on him they shouldn't he's still only 20 years old try to get into the lab get you know have a good off season see if he can make adjustments but it, it's been really unfortunate for santana um and that's it for the guys that are in the top 30 on lists um i, I guess we can kind of talk about some players that aren't on the top 30 i can give you one riser and one faller uh of players that aren't i think on the falling stock falling side of things Isaac Pacheco is somebody that two years ago, a lot of people were like super excited about and was looking really good down in single A, was a teammate of Jackson Jobs when they were in Lakeland together. A lot of people were really pumped. Another guy, he hasn't had an awful year this year, um, but still is just like not hitting nearly as much, has gone into a huge slump. People figured him out and he hasn't been able to recover from that. On the positive side of things, um, Fran Gerber Montia. OK, this is a guy that Tigers minor league report has done a really good job covering. He has been absolutely electric. He was down in the complex to start off the season. Again, just 19 years old switch hitter um, started off the season in the complex and did really well. Walked a ton, didn't strike out too terribly much, um, had really good hitting numbers and OBP over 400. Um, some pop in there as well. Again, from both sides of the plate. Uh, played shortstop on top of that, which is again super exciting, and got called up. And in his first few, he's only I think he's only played three games, two, three, four games in Lakeland, um, and he hasn't hit incredibly well. But there was one play that Tigers minor league report threw out there, where he got on first base, stole second, advanced to third, and then scored on a ground ball to third. Uh, and right after that, like just make stuff happen and has been an absolute electric factory down there in the low levels of the minors. I'm really glad that he is out of the, the, the complex and out of the rookie league. And, and we're going to see him in, you know, single a ball next year. I'm really excited for a full season of single a baseball from him, but he's been a guy that, uh, th there's, th there's been some, some noise around again, Tigers minor league report has done a great job kind of covering him and he's not on. MLB Pipeline's top 30, but is on uh, some other lists top 30 for the Tigers organization. I think he uh, he deserves some recognition. Okay, thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We will, of course, be back tomorrow. We're not previewing Seattle. We just played them. Uh, you know what to expect. We don't need to spend a ton of time on that. And this is already almost a 40-minute show, so I apologize for running long. We'll be back tomorrow talking about the major leagues again. Um, again, we'll go way more in depth on a lot of these guys in uh, in the off season. I know we don't have a ton of time to go through all thirty and like super in depth here in this format today, but we get, we'll have a lot of time this winter to do a lot more in depth breakdowns, kind of break down uh, lists and and et cetera, et cetera. I just want to kind of give an update of you know from the last time we had a prospect organization was toward the beginning of the year. Um, how well in, in fully right we've obviously talked about prospects a lot just throughout episode to episode but i had a full episode dedicated to it it's been a while and i just wanted to kind of give an update on again like kind of the players who have seen their stock rise and have seen their stock fall all right we'll be back tomorrow peace and love going to therapy's dope i'll catch y'all then baby go tigers